All right, tonight we're going to talk about raising private money. How many people here have borrowed private money? Not many. About 5% of the room. How many people have lent private money? Okay. We got a few, but not also about 5%. So I want to talk about that tonight. People say to me all the time, I want to buy real estate, uh, but I, I don't have any money. Right? And really what I'm going to try to show you tonight is that you're just not asking the right people. So we all know that we have banks. We have hard money lenders. You probably heard the phrase private lenders, but maybe you don't even know exactly what that is. Okay, there's all different kinds of lenders out there. Usually, people think that we're looking for like multimillionaires to lend us money. But I'm here to tell you the exact opposite. Multimillionaires are a pain in the ass because they think they know everything. And they want to be they want to be the big boss and they want to charge you points and hit you up with 10% interest. If you don't know what a point is, that's 1% of the loan. So often you might see if you talk to like a hard money lender, he might say, sure, I'll lend you the money. It's, uh, it's 10% plus two points. Well, that means you're paying 12%, right? It's an expensive loan. Have I borrowed money that expensive? Yes. Cheapest money I probably ever borrowed was about 6%. The most I ever paid was 15%. But it was for a phenomenal deal and I made out like a bandit on it, so I'm not complaining. All right, so... The best people that you can ever talk to about money is mom and pops, just regular people. You're not looking for millionaires. You're not looking for somebody who's super rich. You're just looking for a couple of regular people, mom and dad, mom and pop, right? So here's how I approach it. I often will meet people in different places, and I'll say, hey, what do you do for a living? David, what do you do for a living? Uh, three part-time part jobs. I, uh, I facilitate uh, training for separating soldiers, teach them how to get jobs, employment stuff, how to, you know, resumes. I, uh, Bridging the Gap is a nonprofit that, that uh, raises uh, or helps vets get jobs, and we started a coffee product where all the coffees after the military services. So you have Army Strong Blend, Semper Fi, Aim High, Anchors Away, and we're in about 30 shop rights in a couple food towns right now, hoping to make money that way, and uh, working with a uh, finance guy, doing a little bit of life insurance. Okay, so now that I've asked what you do for a living, what might you ask me now? What do you do for a living? I raise private money for amazing real estate deals. Sounds what might you, what yeah. might you say next? Like, what kind of deals do you do? There you go. He asked me. Now he just opened up the door. Okay, look how easy that is, right? So you, when you meet somebody, you just... One time I met a guy in a bar in Doylestown, and I said, you know, some work in the room, as I usually do. And I said, hey, what do you do for a living? And he told me whatever he did. I don't remember. And he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a real estate investor. And... I have this, I buy houses store in Hapro. I used to have this. And, and he says, oh, like that guy in Hapro? I'm like, yeah, exactly like that freaking guy in Hapro. <laughs> right? Okay. But anyway, the point is, you could describe yourself to people in many different ways. But if you use that phrase, well, I raise private money for amazing real estate deals. Does it matter if you actually raise private money for amazing real estate deals? No, it doesn't matter. Okay? You're starting a conversation with somebody. You're piquing their interest. What's, what's an amazing real estate deal? Tell me about what you're working on. And lots of us are working on things. I don't care if you're wholesaling a house like Andrew just did, or if you're buying a mobile home park, or if you're building a building. It doesn't matter. If, if, if you think it's amazing, it's amazing. That's it. There's no rules to this game. Here's a funny thing. Most mom and pops have money. As people get older, they accumulate assets. They accumulate money. 
They have stock accounts. They have real estate. They may own a business. They have money. They might not have a million dollars liquid, but a couple hundred grand. That, gets a long, that goes a long way in the real estate business, right? So, and the funny part is this. The mom and pops have no idea that they could be the bank. Nobody's ever told them. No one's ever talked to them about it. They never thought that that was even a possibility. That's your job. If you're in a situation where you need money, that's the missing element to your real estate portfolio, or that's what's stopping you from the next deal, what you have to do is what I just did with David. I do the same thing over and over and over again. I know a guy who, I, I saw him do it in elevators. I saw him do him, doing it walking down the street. Hey, buddy, what's up, man? You been, how long have you been coming here? You know, we were in a beach town. You know, what do you do for a living? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I raised my private money for amazing real estate deals. <laughs> you, know, you just keep doing it. You will score a lender. So let's just say you're having this conversation, and you've, you've just met somebody who's got some money, and they had no idea. They had no idea. No one ever told them that they could be the bank. They thought only the bank can do that. They're the ones with the money, right? This is how you do it. This is how you can, if you just start doing that, I guarantee you that you're going to score lenders. You're going to meet people, develop a relationship with them, and the first thing I do is I go home and, okay, for example, I have Google Contacts. And I create lists of all my private lenders. Every private lender I meet, minute I, if I get a business card or I get their phone number or whatever I get, and then I go home and I write it down. I put it in my Google Contacts. Okay? And then when a deal pops up and all of a sudden I need a bunch of money, I simply go to my Google Contacts, private lenders. Don't let anyone touch my computer, Pedro. Right? I simply go into that list and there's like 150 names right there of people that I've already talked to, all right? And they may not even remember me, some of them, if the contacts are that old, but there you go. And all of a sudden, you've got this list of people that you can go to to get money for your real estate deals. And if you learn the creative strategies that we teach here, like taking over people's mortgage payments, okay, which is what we call subject to, or people who have a house that's free and clear, and we're going to make payments to those people. We call that seller financing. All these strategies you'll learn. So let, let's talk a little bit about private money. Okay, this was a question that was asked to me by a student. She said, I have a house I want to buy for a rental property. I want to use private money. The amount of the loan would be $127,000, not including repairs. How do I present it to a lender? Okay, so the way I present it, to a lender, this would now be, we're, we're beyond the point of we've, we've met David in the bar and we've talked to him about it. Now, now we're, we're going to our list of people who we know could be potential private lenders. So how do I present it to an individual like that? Well, it's pretty simple. I created this form. Anybody could create this form. It's very simple. I call it the private money investment for pro uh, property summary, okay? And then this, was, this is actually my I Buy Houses store in Hatboro, which I'm now looking to sell or rent to somebody because I'm mostly doing stuff in Florida now. But I worked in this store for five years. And you probably haven't seen an I Buy Houses store. They're not that common. But people would walk into my store and trade in their house, much like Somebody might trade in their car at a car dealership. Probably a lot of us have taken our car to the car dealership and just traded it in and got something else, right? Well, it's the same concept, trade in your house, right? So I bought this store for like, I think I paid uh, 175000 for it like five years ago. And the very first year I started sitting in it, somebody came in and sold me a house that I made like 50 grand off of. I'm like, well, heck, that just, that just paid the, uh, the loan payments I had for like two and a half years. So 
it's a, it's a different kind of concept, but, and I was kicking butt with this, I buy houses store until COVID happened. When COVID happened, not a damn soul walked in my store for about nine months. And I was already getting ready to change my philosophy anyway to do investing in Florida, so I decided to put it up for sale. It's up right now, it's up for sale and up for rent, okay? So back to this private money investment property summary. What I'm doing here is I'm saying, I'm asking a private lender for 220 grand. I don't know if you can see this. The property value is 500 grand. You know, I looked up some comps and gave them that number. And the combined, you know, what's the LTV, the loan to value? I'm only asking for 44% of what this store is. I'm not asking for money on this store now. This is an old deal. I'm just using this as an example. I was willing to pay somebody 7.5% interest. Okay, and my, and my monthly payment to them would have been $1,375. So I'm also to giving them a first position mortgage. You have to let them know what position lien they're getting. Okay, I'm going to get into that in a, in, a, in a few minutes, so you'll learn a little bit more about that. And the term is 60 months, so I'm basically asking for the money for five years. Okay, and this, this is something that I did raise the money for rather easily. And uh, I still have a, a loan on it today. Okay? <clears throat> so what else do I give them? I put in a write-up. I tell them a little bit about what I know about the property. So this property has great visit. It's not really a fancy building. It's, it used to be a gas station. And then, it, and then it became a dry cleaners. Do you want to know what the two most dangerous things a piece of real estate can ever be? Anybody want to guess? Gas station and dry cleaner. A gas station and a dry cleaner. From, yeah, yeah, well, a meth lab would be worse, but that's not a legal business. <laughs> Nobody would run a meth lab at the corner of Byberry, New York. You'd, you'd be out of business real fast. But uh, so when I bought this building, this is interesting, I went to the township. I looked at the environmental issues that had been written up for years. Back in 1985, they decided to rip out the gas, the gas tanks that were buried underground. And of course, it ripped in half. And, and tens of thousands of gallons of gas poured all over the site. So the owner of the building, he skedaddled. He split town. So Hapro got stuck digging up all of the dirty dirt, ripped up the whole parking lot, got 23 commercial grade dump trucks filled up all the dirt that had gas in it into 23 commercial grade dump trucks, took it all away, and they brought back clean dirt, 23 dump trucks, right? Then the EPA came and put wells on this property, and they tested the wells once a month for 10 solid years, and they found nothing. I ended up buying the building like 15 years after that happened, right? Or, or more than that, like 20-something years after that happened, because I didn't buy it until five years ago, okay? So when I went to look at it, I thought to myself, I may never be able to sell this building. I may never be able to sell it, because w with the environmental issues, nobody's going to get a loan for it, right? Right now, I'm asking for half a million for it, so somebody would have to have half a million liquid, right, <laughs> just laying around to buy it because you're probably not going to get a loan on it because of the environmental issues. But we'll see. I don't care if somebody rents it or s buys it. I don't really care. I just don't want to use it anymore. Okay? So this is crazy stuff. It's the only building I've ever bought where I thought to myself, I might not ever be able to sell it. So what would the terms of a loan be? You are the initiator of what you want for this loan. So you get to pick those decisions, the terms, are just written here, like how much would the monthly payment be? How much interest am I offering? What would the LTV be? That kind of thing. You get to choose that. Now, you might have to negotiate. If David wants to lend you the money, and you might have to negotiate with David and pay him a little more or do something different. David might have his own idea about when he wants his money back. So this is, there's no rules to this game. If you walk into a bank, do they have rules? They got so many damn rules, they don't even know what they are, okay? They, they, and, they, and how many times have I applied for a loan 
And they're like, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. Then all of a sudden, it's nothing but problems, right? Because they're freaking bankers, and they don't know what the heck they're doing half the time, all right? And, and the lending world is filled with so much regulation that even the people who do it for a living aren't 100% sure at any given time if you're going to get the money or not. That's why I like private lending. I don't want to be dealing with an institution. I want to be dealing with people. People are a lot easier to deal with. I guarantee you, I don't know anything about David, but I guarantee you he's a lot easier to work with than, say, a bank. I can almost 100% be sure to say that. All right. What else would I put in this summary? I'd write a story about the property. If there's something about the property that's important for the lender to know, I want to tell them about it, OK? And if I was going to rehab it, say it was a house and I was rehabbing a house, I would put in here like a chart and tell him like, hey, this is what I'm going to do to it. This is what it's going to cost, right? And, and borrow the rehab money if I can. Always want to do that. So what else would I do? I'd run comps for them. I'd pick properties in the area, right? These, these are just regular comps and nothing to do with the I buy houses store. But I would go out and I'd run comps so my lender could see that, yeah, this property is worth half a million dollars. And uh, I might want to lend on this property. This is a pretty good property, right? What, what would I write in the story about it? I might talk about the visibility. This property at the corner of Byberry and York has amazing visibility. Because everyone who lives in Montgomery County, they come down Horsham Road, they get to York Road, they make a left, and then they make a right at Byberry to go to 95 to go to Philadelphia downtown. And, and at 5 o'clock, Traffic is backed up with 20, 30 cars in every direction. And what are they looking at when they're standing in traffic? They're looking at my store, <laughs> right? So if you had a pizza shop there or something or, you know, whatever, it's a great place because you've got a captured audience sitting around your store in the morning and in the afternoon. All right? What else would I do? I would give them some photographs. These are some photographs of a beach house that I used to own. And I took pictures of it because my house is the one, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, my house is this house here. And that big giant property next to it is actually, it looks like an apartment building, but it's actually two condos. That's all it is. Yeah, they're like three million a piece. And it's, it's like so tall, the condos are so tall that it blocks my beach house from any sun almost all day long, right? But what's really weird is the owner of that property, uh, he sits up in the very highest floor, and he's always watching everything I do. <laughs> it's weird as hell. When we first bought the place, we are in there, like, you know, fixing things and cleaning things and talking to contractors, and I'm like, why is that freaking guy always up there? You know, it's really weird, really unusual. People do some funny things. Okay. So we talked about raising private money a little bit. So for instance, uh, this was a question that one of my students asked me. She said, for instance, if it's a rental property and not a big chunk of money coming in from the rent, right? how do I pay my private lenders back? Well, that's, that's a damn good question. You better know that before you borrow somebody's money. Otherwise, you're going to have a big problem. right? That lender's going to have, it could basically, if you don't pay them, they can come and take your property. So there's a, and, and it could possibly be a, a credit issue for you. Typically, probably not. You'd be surprised. Private lenders don't always ask for your credit report. They should. But almost everybody I borrowed money off of from doesn't. But, you know, I got no problem if somebody wants to see mine. But it's, it's just funny how people they look more at the property. So a lot of times, when, especially if you're buying commercial real estate, they're interested in you being the lender and that you're going to pay them, but, but they're also really interested in the asset because they have to know that they might one day have to take that asset, right? And if they do, that's going to be their collateral, so they need to know that, okay? Okay. So what kind of paperwork do you need? It's, it's very simple. If you've ever bought a house in your life, you went to settlement, 
you probably had a stack of papers this fat, okay? Most of those papers are phony baloney. But the documents that are really important is a promissory note. A promissory note basically specifies the details between the lender and the borrower. How much, when are the payments going to start? How much are the payments per month? What is the interest rate on those payments? What address am I sending those payments to? This is easy stuff. If you've ever bought a house, go through a folder from even 30 years ago. And the most important documents, you'll find them right there. There's a promissory note that spells out the details between the bank and the buyer, or the hard money lender and the buyer, or the a uh, private money lender and the buyer. It's all the same. It's just a very simple contract that spells it out. And if you were to violate that contract, that very document would be what the, what the lender would take to a judge and file a suit against you to take the property back. Okay? This is an example of what a promissory note might look like. Spell I know it's kind of hard to read, but you get the point, that it spells out what the payments are, what the dates are, and all those kind of things. All right, the other document is the mortgage. The mortgage is something that you could, pr we have documents on our website for a promissory note and a mortgage, but most people might not be comfortable filling those out yourself. And if you went to a title company, you could simply explain to the title company, right, weeks prior to having settlement, you simply explain to them, I would like you to prepare for me a promissory note and a mortgage. And a title company will do that for you. And they have lawyers on staff who know how to do that. So it's not a complex thing for them. It's actually a very easy thing for them. And they can prepare those documents for you. You have settlement. The seller signs it. The lender signs it. The buyer signs it. And those documents get recorded at the courthouse. And that's what we do with the mortgage. It records the lien. Okay? So that if anything goes wrong with this deal, if you don't pay, okay, you can't, it keeps the seller, I'm sorry, it keeps the buyer from being able to sell the property to somebody because there's a lien on this property and this property cannot legally be sold until that lien is resolved, paid, okay? So that's what these simple documents do. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about it, okay? So there's another question from my student is, what if family members are interested in, I have pr family members are interested in doing private lending, but they don't necessarily have huge chunks of money ready to loan. Well, then they're not ready, okay? If, if, if you find a lender who doesn't have enough money that you need to do your deal, you can't work with them. So let's talk about it a little bit. Could I theoretically borrow a couple hundred grand from David but I need more money. I need more than what David has. He only has 200. I need another 100. I could maybe go to Carrie and talk to her about lending me the, ex the other 100. So I'll, what I'd have to do then is I'd have to put David in first position because he gave me more money than Carrie. Carrie's going to, I'm going to put her in second position. And if Carrie knew the business real well, which she's learning now, she might say, because I'm in second position, it's a little more of a dangerous spot, so I want to charge you a little bit higher interest rate. That's something that you can negotiate with your lenders and, and with the buyers and sellers about how to do it. It gets to a point where it'd be easier, of course, if you just found one lender who had the money you need. But if you don't find or you can't find them, using two people is another way to do it. Now, when you get to a certain level where you're buying lots of property, you can create a fund, okay? What you are not allowed to do with a first position lender and a second position lender is I'm going to make payments to David according to what the promissory note says. I'm going to make payments to Carrie according to what her note says. And both of these liens are going to be filed at the courthouse, okay, so that I can't sell the property and not pay you guys. You guys are protected. But what a lot of professional investors do, 
like myself, is we create a fund. So Larry and I just created a fund. Now, when you create a fund, you have a lawyer prepare these documents. It usually costs about 15 to 20 grand to set up a fund, right? The lawyer has to set it up according to the laws of the nation, what you're allowed to do in a fund, and it defines all the rules and regulations. And then what that allows us to do is we could go around and borrow money off of a whole bunch of people and co-mingle that money into a fund. So for example, he has 200, someone else has a million, someone else has 25,000, it can all go into the fund and the fund would have to make interest payments to all these individuals. But it has to be followed extremely carefully because if you do this wrong, you could get yourself into some federal trouble, okay? And you don't want to do that. You absolutely don't want to do that. So if you ever get to a point where maybe, maybe some of you out there have a dream that you might like to build an apartment building or you might like to build something or buy something huge and turn it into something else, and you're going to need millions of dollars to do that, it's not impossible. One of the best ways to do that is to go out and create a fund. There's a lot of changes that have happened in funds over the last few years. Private lending almost didn't even exist prior to 2008. It did exist, but it was very rarely used. Why? Because prior to 2008, if you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan. All you had to do was be alive, pretty much. And they, what? I got, every, uh, I got every loan I ever applied for. I started in this business in 1989 when I was 23 years old. I never got denied a loan. And every single time I asked, the, fi the mortgage company that I work with had an entire filing cabinet with my name on it. I did so many deals, right? After 2008, when the market crashed, I have only done two bank loans in the last 12 years. Isn't that interesting? So I had unlimited funds available to me, and then all of a sudden, after 2008 crash, investors became dangerous, I guess. So these are some of the things that I think we're still dealing with today on some level. I'm actually applying for multiple loans right now in Florida on what the projects I'm working on. And, you know, I'm not completely sure how that's going to pan out. I have private lenders. I have hard money lenders down there. But I want to get to cheap money. I want to go to banks if I can. And I want to get money at 3.75%, right? So one of the other questions was, do you have any examples of a proposal that you could put together for a private lender? Well, I've already shown that, right? So what are the right questions to ask a private lender when they are interested in lending? So suppose, would you, Carrie, would you start handing out those documents, please? So what I've done is, <coughs> instead of having to memorize the things that I say, I already know what the private lenders are going to ask me. I already know, right? So what I did was I put down all of the questions that I've been asked over the years about private lending, I put into these documents, right? All the questions and answers are already there. Be and it makes life a lot easier because you, when you get a hold of this document, you know, we've made a bunch of copies, but I don't think we have one for everybody, but we got it up on the, on the investor schooling website too. Do we? Yes, it's on there. So you can download it right off the Investor Schooling website. So this document was created just to nip it in the butt before there's any problem, right? You send them this document, it's got like six to eight pages, and it already answers all of the questions that the people might have. And a lot of times when I give that document to somebody, they come back and compliment me on it. They're like, oh, that really helped, you know? Right? This is how you do it. There's the document. That's what it looks like. 
There it is. Q&A. What is private lending? How is the money used? Help the sellers and buyers. Market conditions. Rate and term. All of it is explained in there. All right? This is something that any one of you can do. It is not difficult. I told you how I start the conversations. You don't have to start your conversations that way, but that's the way I do it. And I learned it from one of my mentors who raised over $100 million. And I've borrowed like maybe 10% of that much. Like maybe I borrowed about 10 million over the course of my life. He's done at least 10 times, probably more than that by now. So anybody can do this. And this is just something you read that document, go into your file when you bought your house and read your promissory note, read your mortgage. It's not complicated. It's not that tough. And you'll figure it out real quick. And start going around and talking to people and see what happens. There are so many people. Here's a, here's a good question that I often will say to somebody. I'll say, um, you know, I'm a prof they say, oh, what, do, what do you do? I might say, well, I'm a professional investor. Really? What, what do you do? I buy real estate. I do stock options. So I'm going to ask you something. What do you do with your money? I, I don't want you to answer that right now. But you ask somebody what they do with their money, and they'll say, uh, <coughs> I, I got it in a... Um, Got in in a, uh, a 401k plan at the office. I think I'm getting like 6% a year minus the 2% fees. I'm making about 4%. I said, um, I'm working on a real estate deal right now. I think I could probably pay you 6% on that deal. 6%. That's 2% better. What do you think about that? He's reading the document. That's why you never hand out documents to people. You know why? Because the minute you hand them something, they stop listening to you. <laughs> you don't have to be sorry. I'm just kidding around. A salesman told me that once. I was, I was selling a guy, and I handed him a document. And the sales guy got me on a parking lot, and he said, what the hell did you just do? He goes, when you were talking, he was listening to everything you said. Then you handed him that document, and you lost him 100%. He was reading the document. That's just a little tip for you. Don't hand anyone a document when you're talking to them. You got a question, Wendy? Yeah, does it depend on the deal, or do you typically, like if you're figuring out your interest rate that you're going to offer to pay a private lender based on what the bank is charging, or, or does it depend on the deal? It's a negotiation, like anything else. I mean, there isn't like, if the bank's charging this, you go up so much What's higher. the bank got to do with it? I don't know, just to really? make it worth their time. Well, you just have to... Start having conversations with people. Trust me, if you do this and you get good at it, okay, it's like anything else in this world. The people who are really good at it, my friend who's raised over $100 million, he freaking wakes up in the morning and does nothing except raise private money, okay? He got hooked up with a couple of NFL players, and then he started doing presentations. He, he got some of the NFL players that he knew to put a bunch more NFL players in the room. Half of those guys, they think about it, they're really young. They don't have probably financial knowledge, although they, they probably went to college. It doesn't mean that they're financially savvy. Those guys don't know what the heck to do with their money. He found a place to, to use their money. And guys, he'd get good stories from people, and then he would get more money and more money, and he'd go around. If he lent so here's something cool he used to do. Say Glenn was a private lender. And Glenn and I are working together for a year now, and I know I have a good relationship with Glenn, and he's getting paid all the time, so he's very happy with the deal. And he's making more money with me than he knew, didn't realize he could even make, right? I'm going to call him up one day, and I'm going to say, Hey, Glenn, why don't you do me a favor? It's worked out pretty good, right? Right? Could you give me, like, three of your friends' phone numbers who might be be people who have money and might also be interested in lending. And then I call those people and I say, listen, I'm working with Glenn. You know him. I mean, it's going really well. I was just wondering. And that's how my friend raises money. That's how he raised all this money. He builds a relationship, solid relationship with somebody, takes good care of them, pays them on time, pays them early if he can, right? And then he asks Glenn, can I have three names? And the whole thing just keeps exploding like a snowball falling down Mount Everest, okay? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger, all right? 
It's not brain surgery. This business is not that complicated, right? And the way that I'll teach it to you, you're going to see that anybody can do this. It doesn't take a, a brain surgeon, all right? As a matter of fact, at the money multiplier, we're not going to have a brain surgeon there, but we are going to have a rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> we actually are. There's going to be a guy here. Okay, we got one more question. Anybody? Can you use the mic, please? wondering how many deals do you have to do on your own before you feel confident enough to ask pe people for their mom mom money I don't know how confident are you I mean you have to have knowledge you have, you have yeah to sure have sure it takes a, it takes a while like I would suggest that you start out with smaller deals and you start small and then build your way up from there how I many how many one. five ten mm, you know I borrowed about ten million dollars over the years and I could tell you this um, I just how many many times I'd be laying in bed in the middle of the night thinking to myself, holy shit, I owe that guy $7,000 tomorrow, right? I mean, it, it's just the nature of the business, right? You've got to run your properties in a profitable manner so that you can pay your lenders because if you can't, you're going to lose whatever down money you put down. You're going to lose the assets. And if you've invested a lot of your money to fix up that asset, you're going to be one sad camper. So it's no game for the weak. You've got to have your act together. You've got to know what you're doing. And you've got to be responsible. How many deals you, you, you did? How many deals have I done? Before, before you asked for private money. I started asking for private money after 2008 when I couldn't get a bank loan. Right. And I m went down to Florida in 2012, and I bought... Over $10 million worth of real estate with the $10 million I borrowed, okay? And I made millions off of it. One of those deals is right over there above the thermostat. That's a tiny house park that I own in Florida. All right? So you guys can do this, and I want to hear that you're doing it. So if you're actually having that conversation with people, I raised private money for amazing real estate deals. I want to hear about that. I'd love to hear about that. You can do it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>